We'll be singing together from our program sheets. Lead me to Calvary. King of my life, I count thee now. Thine shall be the glory, lest I forget thy sun-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. <laughs>
Father, we thank you for the beginning this morning again. We're praying, O oh Lord, that you will open our eyes of understanding today so that the work you have given us to do will be done in a better way in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you keep every one of us awake and alert so that we will not miss what you are teaching and telling us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. For we pray in Jesus' name. Looking at our program on page 6, you will see that we left out a message yesterday, the effective ministry because of time. So that is what we'll be dealing with now, and it's after that we'll go to the next part of the program for this morning, which is building the church. The effective ministry. Let's uh, see in Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We have a ministry of reconciling the enemies of God unto God, reconciling sinners to God Almighty through the grace of God in the Savior. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Here we are told that there are special ministries, like the ministries of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. And these ministries are to equip the saints, mature the saints, instruct the saints. It says it in this way, for the perfecting of the saints. And then it says, these saints, as they are equipped and matured, will be prepared for the work of the ministry. So then, it is not only that we are reconciling sinners to the Lord, we are also Developing those converts to become disciples, to become saints, and to become people that are well trained and well equipped for the work of the Lord. So we are also raising up matured workers for the kingdom of God. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Here Paul instructed Timothy that he should be certain of the kind of ministry he has had, and in particular he singles out the ministry of an evangelist. And then he says, he should make full proof of that ministry, which means he should show that he was really effective on the job God had called him to do. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. 
it is not enough to come into the ministry or to have the ministry. We must make full proof of it. We must make sure that that ministry is fulfilled. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 1 to verse 2, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, walking, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of of God. Our ministry also involves handling the word of God appropriately. Not handling the word deceitfully. That means we handle that word of God, the word of truth, appropriately. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 verse 4 Acts Chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. As we're talking about the effective ministry, every one of us ought to know what an effective ministry is. In having an effective ministry, we should know what we are called to do and do it to God's expectation and satisfaction. The measurement of effectiveness will depend upon what God knows, what he says about the ministry we operate in. However praiseworthy our actions, our activities, and our ministry may be in the sight of men, however commendable it may be in the sight of men and women like us. If God's plan for that ministry, if God's purpose for that ministry is not achieved, it is not an effective ministry. Which means then, it is not just the outward characteristics or the outward results that we see. It is to know that actually the ministry we are called into has achieved the purpose of God. Only then is it an effective ministry. And we're particularly considering each leader's ministry in the church. And you need to consider your own ministry in particular. You are a coordinator over an English district church. Consider what you are called upon to do. And see whether you are doing those things satisfactorily in the sight of God, meeting with God's expectation all around. It is only then you are an effective minister in the sight of God or as a Yoruba coordinator. You look at what God has called upon you upon to do or as an Igbo church coordinator or language church coordinator. You look at what God has called you to do. And only when you have satisfied God's expectation are you an effective minister. The same thing will go for you as a women's coordinator in the district where you are. Are you getting something done that will satisfy God that he placed you in such a position? Are you making sure that whatever the difficulties and hindrances you are actually achieving the purpose for which you are called or the children's church district coordinator. Are you doing what ought to be done to God's expectation so that you will know that the purpose of God's selection, choice of you, calling for you is actually achieved. Now, before we can know whether the purpose is fulfilled or not, we will need to determine the purpose. Why we have the ministry that we have. As we look at the purposes, 
But we'll see as we examine ourselves, examine the activities that we carry on, and examine also the results of those activities, whether we are fulfilling the purpose of God or not. I've listed some of the purposes for us to be able to examine ourselves in the ministry. What are the purposes for our being selected to leadership? Leadership in your own area of involvement. Number one, to teach, instruct, enlighten the saints. Before we were chosen as coordinators, the church had already won a lot of converts, discipled a lot of them, and we can refer to them in the New Testament language as saints. Now you were chosen as a coordinator in that district so that you will teach, instruct, and enlighten the saints. And all that I say, you apply to yourself. I'm not only talking to a small group of coordinators. I'm not only talking to the men. I'm not only talking to the women. I'm not only talking to those who are involved with adults. I'm talking to every one of us here. You have a ministry in the sight of the Lord. So you will take each of these things and examine very closely and see whether you are doing it. So are you teaching, instructing, and enlightening the saints? How many of the saints are you actually teaching and instructing and enlightening? How many of them are actually well taught, well instructed, well enlightened? How many of them are now overcoming all the difficulties they have in the understanding of the word of God as a result of your teaching ministry? How many of the ignorant people have been so instructed and so enlightened that now they know the way to go? Number two, to encourage, lift up, admonish, and counsel the people. We're not only to teach, but we're to encourage. Because times of discouragement, times of depression, time of stress and strain, time of confusion, may come to any of the people in the church under your leadership. And you will need to encourage them, lift them up, admonish them, counsel them. And as we look at our ministry in the district, and as we look at the responsibilities God has given us, can we say that on a regular basis, can we say that uh, we are actually encouraging and lifting up? Are we making sure that this ministry of encouragement, admonition, and counsel has actually been given or effectively carried out with the members in the church that have problems and that are discouraged, are in stress or strain? Are we spending our time to help these people? Or are we only uh, perhaps um, maybe teaching the scripture, perhaps only standing there when the cassette message is to be played? Or are we really doing the work of lifting them up? Those who are about to backslide, are we running after them? Are we going to their houses? And are we encouraging, admonishing, counseling them? Number three, we as leaders are called on to lead, to guide, to show the way, to reveal God's will for every individual in different areas of his life. We are to lead. We lead by teaching. We lead by practical example. We lead by showing the people the word of the Lord for every situation. Are we leading in that way? And are we leading not just a minority in the district? Are we leading all the people that have to be led? Are we guiding them? 
Are we telling them where the pitfalls are? Are we showing them where the dangers are? Are we showing them things that could lead them away from the Lord and warning them concerning those things? And are we guiding them to always look at the Lord, look at the Savior? Are we showing the way and revealing God's will for each individual? They may need to know God's, in the, God's will in their personal lives. The will of God concerning holiness and sanctification. They may need to know the will of God in their businesses. That they need to get involved in a kind of business that will not lead them away from the Lord. They may need to know the will of God in the kind of friendship they have or they maintain. And when it comes to the area of marriage, they will need to know the will of God. Are we leading them? Are we guiding them? Are we showing the way? Are we revealing God's will? God's plan for each individual? Are we only concentrating on those who are zonal leaders, who are women representatives, and who are workers? Or are we having this ministry of leading and guiding for the whole of the district church? Or for the whole of the women in that district? Or for the whole of those people that come to that language church. Or for all the children that come. Or don't we know that those children too, they need leading, guiding. They need to be shown the way. And for God's will to be revealed to them too. Number four. Training. Equipping. Involving. So that we can make each member of the church useful in the kingdom this is one of our responsibilities and this is part of the ministry god has given to every one of us as a leader that we will need to train now when we talk about training it is not just that we give a short message on saturday during the Saturday workers' meeting. It is not just that maybe before we prepare for a women's fellowship in the month, we give a short exhortation to the sisters to tell them how to make publicity, how to invite the people. Train up a child in the way he should go. Train up each member in the way they should go. You see the way that our children are taught at school. If uh, your child is at school and the teacher only teaches lessons and uh, never marks any paper, never looks at the failures or the successes of your child as an individual child, never gives assignment appropriate to the rate of learning of your own child, and all that your child says is that, well, we go to school. And our teacher teaches us. I take down the notes. And he sometimes gives us assignment to do. He never looks at the assignment. He never gives me personal attention. That child is not being trained. It's not being taught. You see, you are called upon as a leader in the church so you can train. That means that it is not just that you are preaching to the workers. It is not just that you are preaching to the people. You are also giving them assignment. And you are looking at what they are doing, how they are understanding. And you are giving particular attention to each individual. And you are equipping each individual. And you are moving on with them according to their rate of growth. According to their rate of understanding. And... As you see them being trained and equipped, you are involving them. Involving them. Oh, you say there is not much I can involve them in because only one person teaches the scripture in the month. And I can only tell one person to make announcement on a Monday or on a Sunday or on a Thursday to be in charge of the prayer and the testimony time. Well, you can involve them in a lot of things. You can involve them in open-air preaching. 
you can involve them in organized evangelism. And the organized evangelism is not what you may be thinking about, that we call them together on Saturday, we're going to evangelize now, remember these people are perishing, and then we send them out two by two. That's not what I'm talking about. If you are going to evangelize yourself, sometimes you take them along with you. Maybe two at a time, maybe one at a time. And also, if you are going to, you need, uh, somebody needs counseling. You say, see that brother, let him counsel you. And while that brother counsels this person, you ask him later, what did you tell him? What was the result of the counseling? And if he made any mistake, then you correct him and show him the right approach. And then you involve him again. It is that involvement that makes the teaching and the training we have given them to actually stay with them. And your purpose is that you want to make everyone in the church useful in the kingdom of God. Everyone in the church useful in the kingdom of God. Then number five, you want to bring sinners. You want to bring in sinners and open their spiritual eyes to the gospel truth so that they can be saved. There should be an ongoing process of bringing sinners in their multitudes into the church. Otherwise, there will be no babies born into the kingdom. So, you need an ongoing process. That ongoing process may be that on Saturday, all the workers will have to knock on the doors of people and tell them that tomorrow is the Lord's day. Tomorrow is Sunday. Tomorrow is the day we ought to remember our Creator. And therefore they invite them in a very definite way to come to the church. They might have to have in their hands Operation Andrew cards and bring those sinners in to the sanctuary. Or they may have to have some leaflets in their hands that they will give to the people around and tell them there's a good thing happening in, around this place. You don't have to travel far now uh, to a far location at Bagada. Now it is very near you here. Well, we may have to do one thing or the other to make sure that there are sinners there. Now, when the sinners have come, we need to be, you remember what I told you last night, as one of the secrets of Christian growth, you exercise your spiritual muscles. That is, if you do not know how to present uh, the gospel message to sinners before, you will try, you will endeavor, and you will make sure that you give a convincing, exciting message, an interesting message, a drawing magnetic message, Unto these sinners so that they can be brought to the Lord. Remember you are also involving other people. Remember that you are encouraging other people to also exercise their spiritual muscles. Therefore you will grant them opportunities. So that you will open the spiritual eyes of these sinners to the gospel truth. So that they can be saved. As they are getting saved, you are involved yourself in their water baptismal classes. You are not just saying, well, what about sinal classes is good. They are going on there. I am not involved. I am involved in other things. You are involved in everything. Your presence matters. And your involvement matters. You can get other people involved, but you should be there. Number six, keep the converts in the faith and in the church. Keep the converts in the faith and in the church. Keep the converts. How do you do that? We have discovered that the wholesale approach doesn't work very much. That is that we bring them together, these people are being converted, and we tell them that we want them to just, and we want them to know the Lord want them to keep in the faith and to keep in the church. Therefore, we are organizing a particular meeting for them in the, in the district church. When they all come, somebody is going to talk to them. That 
one day kind of meeting with all the converts all together without knowing their individual needs, individual backgrounds, without having direct one-to-one -one fellowship and contact, that kind of mass meeting with the new converts will not always be successful. But let us say there are 30 converts for this week. Already we know that we have zonal leaders, we have women reps, and we have some other intelligent and matured area leaders. By the time you think about the whole district, you're thinking about at least 10, at least 15. And then you get all the names of these, um, of these people and you say, now you go to such and such, you go to such and such, and you yourself will go to another individual. If you want to uh, really keep those new converts, you will go to them one by one. If there are 30 and there are about 15 of you, you can leave maybe Tuesday evening or maybe Friday evening or maybe Saturday morning or maybe Sunday afternoon. You can leave it free and then go to these people and sit down with them and share with them. You can get together our converts um, outlines, the teachings that were given before after a particular crusade, and you can deal with number one with them. When it is a zonal leader himself doing it, a coordinator himself doing it, or it is a woman rep herself doing it, you will find that it will be effective, and you'll be able to keep these converts in the faith and in the church. Then also, if you are wanting to train other people, a zonal leader will go with maybe a house fellowship leader. A woman rep could go with a house fellowship leader. An area leader could go with just a believer in the church that is not even a worker at all. And as this leader is sharing with these new converts, this person that you have taken along will be watching, will be learning, and will be assimilating, will be getting into him the methods of keeping people in the faith and in the church. Before three months, all these people you have been taking out every time, every week, and they have been seeing how you are dealing with the converts so as to keep them in the church, you will see that they too will know the method of keeping them in the faith and in the church. Therefore, we need to apply all these methods and do something concrete, something very systematic, so that we will be able to keep them in the ways of the Lord, show them the ways to grow, show them how to be steadfast in Christ. Number seven, you need to keep the whole church in love and fellowship and in the grace of God. That's part of our ministry. If you are a real minister of the gospel and God has placed you in the church as a coordinator, women's coordinator, language church coordinator, or children's church coordinator in that district, then all your actions, all your utterances must keep the church in love. You see, there are some leaders that do not recognize their own ministry. And the way they talk to one individual in the church about another individual in the church can cause division and disunity. But to see as a leader in the church, everything you share with anybody in your church must keep the church in love. And you must be very, very thoughtful. You see, sometimes you think that you are, trust, you are talking to a trusted worker, a committed worker. And you are talking about another worker who is not well committed. Well, even though that person may not be as committed as you expected, you understand that if you talk negatively about him and he hears, that's not going to increase the love in the church. That's not going to increase the unity in the church. Therefore, every action, every teaching, every encouragement or exhortation, every teaching or admonition that you give, any allusion you make to anything, to anyone, must keep the whole church in love and in fellowship 
and in the grace of God. Number eight, you must be planning programs that will keep the church lively. You must be planning programs that will keep the church lively and keep the church fruitful and keep the church purposeful and keep the church spiritual. We cannot be in the, we cannot have a church in the district and then the church is dead, inactive, never getting anything done, never planning anything. And the new babes there, new babes in Christ, they don't know that the church is an active church. We must keep on planning programs that will keep the church lively and fruitful and purposeful and spiritual. You take all those words together. You must not be lively without being fruitful. That will be the waste uh, the wasteful exertion of energy and the wasteful spending of resources. You keep the church lively at the same time fruitful. You keep the church purposeful at the same time as lively. You see, we cannot just be lively and say, well, our church is lively. We have this activity. Is it purposeful? You know the purpose why you are called to be a leader in the church, then fulfill that purpose and make it spiritual. You see, we cannot just be lively at the expense of being spiritual. Bring everything together. Lively, fruitful, purposeful, and spiritual. Number nine, you lead each member to become a soul-winning disciple of Christ who makes evangelism the normal lifestyle. That is our ministry, that you will train and equip every member until every member becomes a soul-winning disciple of Christ. Not just a disciple, a soul-winning disciple who will make evangelism the normal lifestyle. Number 10, you raise up a growing, praising, joyful, strong church in the district that is capable of multiplying itself in a period of time. The district church must uh, be happy that we are in the district. There must not be any kind of sorrow, sadness, complaint, or regret, saying, why did we stop going to Bagada? Why are we not all together? Because our church over here, uh, we are just kept as a group together. But then it is not a growing church, a praising church, a joyful church, a strong church in the district, capable of reproducing and multiplying itself in a period of time. Now, you see all these areas as the ministry that God has called us to. To have an effective ministry then is to fulfill God's purpose of ministry in the church, in all these areas. And as you are taking down notes, you will need to read over later and pray through on them and uh, believe that by the grace of God, one by one, you can carry out all these things. You may need to share with other leaders in the district. And reveal to them, this is the purpose of our existence. And the purpose of our church in this locality. And the purpose of our own kind of ministry in the large ministry of the big central church. Therefore, let us see how we are going to fulfill them. It will take planning. It will take a lot of things. Now, to be able to do this. We will need to prepare ourselves in seven different areas. To be able to have all these things fulfilled and to be effective as ministers of the gospel in all these areas that we have outlined, there are se at least seven things that come out very clearly where we need to develop ourselves, where we need to prepare ourselves. Number one, 
We need to be more thoroughly prepared in leadership qualities. Leadership qualities. Already we've dealt much with that in our combined workers meeting recently. That the leader is referred to as a shepherd, as a captain, as a ruler, as a father. And he is supposed to have the leadership qualities of the shepherd, of the captain, of the ruler. And so, we should develop leadership qualities. Let's look at First Timothy. First Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. The part I want you to particularly take note of here is that he rules well. He leads well. If he's going to rule and lead the church of God, he must be able to rule his own house. Lead his own house. There is much similarity between your own house and the household of faith. Especially if you have a few children that are of different ages and some of them are more matured than others some are younger much younger than the others you will see that they will exhibit different characteristics and yet you are able to rule them you might say i'm having difficulty being able to bring all of them under control you may be having little difficulty, but at least you're able to keep them in the family. And you're able to make them look up to you as a father or as a mother. And you're doing a good job by and large, more than maybe some parents outside. If you're doing that already, then you can transfer all the patience you have got to have in your own family. Transfer that to the church too. You are patient with your children. Be patient with the members in the church. You are loving to your children. Transfer that to the church and be loving to the church. And especially when one of your children becomes very sick and very weak, you know what you do. You may even take time off your employment and take care of that child. Transfer that to the church too and have that care and that concern. And when one of your children may be confused, not knowing what course to take, what way to go, what friend to choose, then you come to the aid of that, your child, and you counsel, you help. Transfer that to the church too. You rule the house, you also lead in the church. So I said, number one, we need leadership qualities. Number two, we need preaching, teaching, ministry. It says at the end of that verse 2, apt to teach. Apt to teach. 
Now, it means that as a leader, as a coordinator, and I told you yesterday that your position makes you a, an evangelist, at least in a limited sense, in your district church, makes you a teacher, makes you a pastor. And as you have all these attributes, all these ministry to fulfill, you need to take care of the ministry of preaching and teaching. The ministry of preaching and teaching. Now, they said, somebody has said, that teachers are born, not made. But there is no teacher that is not made. You see, a person may have some natural talents and natural ability in teaching. But then, if he doesn't develop, he's not going to be able to teach well. And a person may start out in life not a good teacher, not a person who is uh, well experienced in teaching. If we, he will discipline himself and study and practice, he can become eventually a person that knows how to teach very well. After all, the Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you. If you find the preaching, teaching ministry lacking in your own life, why don't you ask the Lord and see, can you shall find, and knock, and it shall be given unto you. It says, everyone that asketh, receive it. Because the Lord has placed you in that position where you have to teach, where you have to preach, and he cannot mock you and tease you to just place you there and not give you the know-how and all the weapons that you need. And he knows that for the position that you stand in, in that church, in that locality, you need the teaching, preaching ministry. It says, ye have not, because ye ask not. If we ask, he will give unto us. Number three, balanced, all-round, project supervision. Balanced, all-round, project supervision. You see, the work of a church is not just a, a one-item project. You think about the many things in the church, and you need to put in your weight and put in your time and put in your experience so that you will be a good supervisor in every area. For example, there is the area of music in the church. You have to get involved. There is the area of building in the church. You have to get involved. There is the area of developing workers in the church. You have to get involved. There is the area of visitation and evangelism in the church. You have to get involved. There is the area of even raising funds. Because you know sometimes you want to have a retreat. You want to have a crusade. You want to have some kind of program or project. And it needs funds. You need to be able to raise the funds. Therefore, you need a balanced all-round project supervision. So that whatever the church has to do, you are a leader. And it is not that we'll be saying, ah, where is uh, our brother? Or where is our sister? And they will say, don't you know brother so-and-so? Don't you know sister so-and-so? This is not a area. He is not interested in this area at all. When you talk about ushering in the church, he says, go and do it the way you know how to do it. That's not my area. I'm not interested in that area. You have to be interested. You must have a balanced all around project supervision. Now, number four, planning and development of practical, workable, sound strategies for growth. If we're going to grow in the district, we cannot just be attending the district church and go in and come out and go in and come out. There must be planning and there must be the development of practical, workable, sound strategies for growth. Now, notice these words I use deliberately. We're talking about strategies. And we're talking about planning. You have a goal that has been set. And the goal is according to the New Testament. And then you want to plan so that you will be able to achieve that goal or reach that goal. The details of what you will do. The methods you will apply. The things that we'll have to put in place so as to have that plan fulfilled and that goal achieved, that's what we call the strategy. 
the strategy must be practical, not theoretical. You see, there are people that can give you a lot of strategies, and they are just theoretical. They are not workable. They are not practicable. But it must be practical. Not only that, workable. Workable. That is, we must make sure that the people in the district have enough knowledge, have enough understanding to be able to work out the strategies or make it work. And it must be sound. Sound. The things we do must be in line with the sound teaching of the word of God. We cannot just say, well, it is strategy. And it is supposed to bring in people into the church. It's supposed to make us, uh, to give us converts in the church. Is it sound? Is it according to the sound teaching of the word of God? So then, there should be development of practical, workable, sound strategies for growth. Number five, there should be evaluation of progress and collection, keeping, and use of data. There should be evaluation of progress. If you are planned for the district church, if you are planned for the women's fellowship, if you are planned for the children's church, if you are planned for the language church, then keep on evaluating the progress. How far are we now in the plan we've made for this area of ministry? How far are we reaching the people? What results are we getting? What success are we achieving? Evaluate the progress and then make sure that you collect data. And you keep those data and you use the data. You collect, you keep, you use the data. Uh, now, you will have a lot of data. And it should be analyzing the church data. For example, we just have attendance. Now, that attendance, how do you use that? We want to find out sometimes how many men, how many women. What do we need that for? We need that to know whether we have enough women in the church for these are young brothers to get married to when eventually they are uh, at the age of marriage. If we don't think about it now, we will not be able to use that data and bring more women into the church and solve our marriage problem. We want to look at our data to see how many of the people, how many of the men and the women are having their wives and their husbands away, not living with them. Why do we need that data? We need that data to be able to know their need. If many of them have marriage problems and their husbands or their wives are not living with them and their major concern is that how will my wife be with me? How will my husband be with me? Then we need to be able to have a kind of program, a kind of faith development how they will be able to have their husbands and their wives back onto them. We, we look at the data. We look, we analyze everything. And the analysis will make us to know the kind of problems they have. And also we'll be able to know where we are productive, where we are not productive. Let's say, for example, in the church, that uh, we do not have the educated people coming in. We have to examine why are they not coming in. What is lacking in our program that these people are not coming in well we evaluate our progress we collect keep and use the data number seven is the counseling ministry the counseling ministry uh, without the counseling ministry you will not be able to solve a lot of problems in the church therefore a leader in the church will need to understand the necessity of the counseling ministry and you will also make yourself available for counseling Number seven, healing and deliverance ministry. The healing and deliverance ministry. From the beginning of the Bible to the very end, we see the healing ministry and the deliverance ministry. And also in the church, we have seen how God has used the healing ministry and the deliverance ministry. And therefore, we have to see that part of our work is that we will have the healing deliverance ministry in the church. Now, it is possible for us to have the prayer warriors. But if we're going to have the prayer warriors, the coordinators, either of the language church or the English church, must uh, really have good supervision. And the coordinators themselves must be well balanced so that you're able to instruct these people and say, this is the limit of your ministry. You can't say that to that person. 
You can't make that kind of prophecy to that person that you are not here as prayer warriors to prophesy and give dreams and tell people who to marry and who not to marry and tell them what to do and what not to do. That you just pray for the people as they come. And if uh, the prayer warriors are there, we have to keep a record of what they are doing. And the coordinator has to be involved in training them and teaching them and instructing them. It is not good and it is not helpful for the district church if the prayer warriors feel that they have a special ministry that the coordinator knows nothing about. They still have to be under the leadership of the coordinator. And he has to be able to train them, instruct them, and he has to be able to handle cases they are not able to handle. That is when they will know they are under the leadership and the authority of the coordinator in the district. So then, we ourselves, as leaders, leaders over men and women, leaders over the women, leaders over the children, we should also have the healing deliverance ministry. I'm sure you know there are a lot of passages we have quoted on each of these areas. But um, I'm leaving you to find those passages because of our time and because of other things I still need to cover. Now, all these seven areas I have explained that we need to develop ourselves in. If we're going to have an effective ministry, I cannot thoroughly speak about all the seven areas in a short time that we have. But I'm hoping that this will not be uh, our last um, coordinator's uh, special meeting by the grace of God. That at all, in other times, we'll be able to deal with some of the special areas that I believe we as leaders in the church that we need to know about. So, before I conclude, I will briefly talk on just one point. And that is the preaching, teaching ministry. I want to expand a little more on that because uh, I told you last night you ought to find opportunities to preach every week. Even if you are not opportuned in preaching on a Monday, on a Thursday, on a Sunday, find opportunity, create opportunity at a free time so that by the grace of God you'll be exercising your gift in that area and you'll be developing. So then, in talking about the preaching and teaching ministry, I want to talk briefly on how to prepare a message. How to prepare a message. We have some points we need to look into as we talk of preparing a message. Now we know that we all have Bible. It's like any of you men now, if, um, you know, your wife says, well, I'm going to a particular special meeting. And uh, the pastor wants us uh, women to come to this special meeting, so I'll be away for uh, one or two days. And since we do not have a maid, let me show you how to prepare a meal. Oh, you say not necessary. The ingredients are there. You have uh, the things in the cupboard and the things in the kitchen. I know how to light the stove. Can I just tell you the step-by-step -step process of putting all the things? Don't you think I know how to prepare a meal for myself? I know there should be oil there. There should be pepper there. Won't you measure them? I know the measure. Once, uh, you know, I taste it. Go your way. I'm all right. And the wife said, but let me show you. The, you know, all the things we put inside to make it very sweet. Uh, you will hear testimony when you come. Go to your pastor's uh, program. When you come, I'll tell you how I did it. And therefore, the husband did not learn how to do it. And eventually, the wife came for that special program. And the uh, husband, you know, put on the stove and put uh, the kettle on it. And he says, uh, what do you pour in for? Water, oil? And uh, uh, I about uh, the cubes. Uh, why do you even put the cubes? Do you put the cubes when you already put uh, the food on the table? Or do you put it while you're still cooking it? And eventually he cooks everything and he was not able to eat it. You know, sometimes people can say, we have Bible. And we know where the references are. We can prepare the messages ourselves. But why don't let me show you how to prepare a message that will stir up the hearts of the people. That will lead them to a decision. That will make them prayerful. And that will make them the kind of people they ought to be. Now, as we prepare this, 
And as we, you know, show you all these steps, your first, uh, your first um, trial may not be what it ought to be. Let me just remind you. Do you see all these journalists that are writing in our newspapers? Do you see all these journalists that are writing even in international newspapers? There was a time they didn't know how to write a short essay, a short composition at school. And they will write a composition. And then the teacher will mark with red biro and say, this one is wrong. The paragraphing is not right. And the structure is not right. The grammar is not right. And they got two over ten, three over ten. But they never got discouraged. They kept on doing it, kept on doing it until eventually now they are writing for national and international papers. Your first message that you preach may even disappoint you. And you may feel that this is not good enough. Never mind, keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Eventually, you'll be surprised what a kind of qualified, equipped teacher you become. And I know you will become in Jesus' name. So then, in preparing a message, what are we going to, uh, what points are we going to take note of? Number one, have the topic to be dealt with. First of all, you determine the topic. It is possible somebody is giving you the topic, or it is possible that you are making out the topic yourself. And the topic should not be a very long sentence. The topic should be very short. Just having a few words in the sentence. Have the topic to be dealt with. Number two. Know the audience that you are preaching that message to. Know the level of their understanding. Know their academic level. Their social level. Their spiritual level. Because if you are preaching a message that will minister to the hearts of the people, you must, you must not speak above them. You must speak to the level of their understanding and to the level of their spiritual qualification. So, know your audience. First of all, you have known your topic. Then, you think about your audience. This time, we went to Russia that I needed to preach to the people. I needed to know their level because, you see, many of them would not have known many of them did not have bibles and many of them did not have real understanding of all the verses that we have known and you still needed to preach from the scriptures and you need to keep yourself very simple so that you can be well understood you must know your audience there are times i go to the student body and these student bodies because i know them as students and I know the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, education that they have. Because I know the audience, I know at what level to take them. But sometimes I go to have a crusade in uh, maybe a locality where the education is not much. I would need to know the kind of statements I make and the kind of illustrations I make. And sometimes I'm talking to an individual person. You know, you need to also know about your voice. Because sometimes you are talking to an individual person and you are shouting. As if you are talking to 5,000 people. And the person is wondering, why is he shouting? Does he think I'm deaf? Therefore, you need to know when you are talking to a few people, when you are talking to many, many people. Uh, this last, uh, this year, I went to a particular country and I had the opportunity of talking to the president of the country. Now, you see, when you want to bring the gospel message to the president of a country, you have to have a different approach. You know, out in the street, you meet somebody, you want to preach evangelism, you want to preach a gospel message to that person, you may say, are you born again? Are you a child of God? Do you know the Lord? Have you been forgiven? Are you living a different kind of life? Do you know Jesus? You can have some direct approach. But then you have now the president of a country. You have to know your audience. We got in there, and as we got in there to his, the state office, uh, my wife was there, another national was there, the interpreter was there, because they speak uh, French, 
and I speak English. So the first thing I we greeted and you know all the other preliminaries we did. After that, I said uh, my wife should go out and the national should go out. The reason I did that is that we cannot talk intimately about sin in a personal way when you know a woman is there before the president because he will be shy he will not want to own up and open up and therefore you have to make all the environment conducive to what you know you want to do then the national i told the national to go out because you know this is the president of their country here is a national how will the president openly accept before the national that uh, you know this is who he is so after they have gone out I said I just made them to go out. I told him so that we can just, you know, talk together in an intimate way. And, uh, you know, there are four steps that you can, you know, you want to emphasize. Number one, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What are, what are you going to say? Are you going to say Romans chapter 3 verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because it is all you, President, you are a sinner. If you say that in a direct way, you will lose him, you will lose opportunity, and you may not even be able to come back to preach to the citizens. But I didn't do that. I gave him my own life. I gave him where I've been, attainments, education. Then I said, but you know, on top of all this, I realized I was a sinner. I realized that I wasn't acceptable in the sight of God. And I realized that with all my efforts, I couldn't save myself. That's another part of Romans, that by the deeds of the law, no man shall be justified before God. Then somebody told me about Jesus that died on the cross of Calvary. And I realized that if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be saved. And I prayed and I had the joy of salvation. And I was forgiven. I said, do you know that since that time, that things have been different in my life, then he stopped me. He said, do you know too that I realize I'm a sinner? That's the approach. You need to know your audience. And he told me, I read Bible once in a while, but it's only when I get into trouble I read Bible. But ordinarily, I don't remember God when things are alright. But when there is crisis and when there is, you know, problem with the country, then I remember, then I pick up the Bible. But he said, what you have talked about, having this kind of life that you remember God all the time, whether there is crisis or not crisis, that that is what I want. You see, be, be with that now you can know how to lead the person to have the same salvation that you have got. And then immediately after we finished, then we came out. And the journalists and the media people with their television and cameras, they came and they came to me and they said, what is it you are discussing with the president? Now, what are you going to say? Are you going to say, well, uh, I'm an evangelist and I came to the country to preach salvation and it will be a wonderful thing if the president got born again. If you say that, they're going to show that in their national television. And the president will see that and he will not allow you to talk to him again when you come next time. Oh, I said, well... We just, uh, we've been given opportunity in the country, and as we're given opportunity, it will be courteous to come and say thank you to the president on behalf of the whole country. And that we're just, uh, you know, discussing together just to appreciate the Lord and appreciate the country as well. They say, any other thing? I said, well, the summary of everything is that, you know, we came to say thank you and to share together to know one another more closely and intimately. And, you know, a president like that will be happy that this man did not degrade him before the other people. Then I said, I wanted to pray for him if there was any personal problem. And uh, I didn't say, well, uh, I'm going to pray for you. If you have a personal problem in your family because, uh, after all, the devil is no respecter of anybody. And uh, the devil is no respecter of president, politician, anything. If you say it like that, you're not going to get anyway. Uh, so I said, um, I don't know how this happens. And it is not because I'm so high. But I discovered that when I pray for people, God answers. I discovered that sometimes people have cancer. And I pray for them. 
and God answers. That even medical doctors, engineers, and government officials, that uh, they have real serious problems, and after prayer, the Lord normally answers the prayer. I said, um, I don't want you to just agree that I should pray for you. If you feel convenient, we'll pray on any problem you have. If there is no definite specific problem, we'll just pray generally that God should be with you and be with the country. He said, I have a problem. And it was a family problem. Deep, deep family problem. You know, if you don't have that approach, a proper approach, he's not going to open up and tell you his personal problem because of his position. Now, when we got out of that place, the, my interpreter there, who is also a pastor and a missionary there, he told me, he said, I have seen the president, I've been privileged to see him on a number of occasions. I've never heard that thing. That that thing he said is only rumored in the country. People only are carrying the rumor that, you know, there's a problem like this, but nobody has ever been able to say categorically that that was the first time he will hear it categorically because the president himself told me, he said, this is a problem. And we prayed about it. And when we came out of his office, all those media people, I didn't tell them that this is what I knew. I just told them, we, I came to appreciate the president and appreciate the country. So, you must know the audience. Very sensitive to the attitude and to the position and the level of understanding of the audience. Then that will help. Number three, determine the purpose and the goal of the message. With proper understanding and meaning of the topic. When you are given a topic you want to preach on, Understand the meaning of that topic. Understand what scope that topic ought to cover. And determine the goal of the message. This message that we are giving, what is the goal? Is the goal just to inform people? Or is it to instruct people? Or is it to inspire people? Or is it to lead them into a kind of action? Determine the purpose of the message. Number four, there should be good introduction leading to the body of the message. A good introduction. What can we say about a good introduction? A good introduction is what you say at the beginning of the message that will stir up interest in the people to want to hear what you have to say in the message. It is the short thing you say at the beginning of the message to stir up interest that the people will want to hear the message. The introduction should highlight the need for the message. The introduction should highlight the need for the message. The introduction may actually be an illustration, an example, a passage from scripture. Sometimes it can be even a testimony. The introduction is supposed to break down the resistance or the prejudice of the audience to the subject you are preaching about. Let's say you are preaching about a particular subject, you know that the people will like to resist. They don't want that kind of subject. They don't want that kind of message. The introduction is supposed to break down their resistance or their prejudice and make them feel at ease and relax before you give the message. Then you make that introduction brief and to the point. Brief and to the point. Now number five. Make the main part of the message. That is what we will call the body of the message. Should have some of these things I'm going to talk about now. One, clear points to facilitate remembrance. Maybe you have two points to emphasize, three points to emphasize, or four points to emphasize. Those points should be clear points that will facilitate, that will make it easier for the people
to remember the message. And each of those points should not be isolated and detached from the other. Let's say there are three points, for example. Point one should naturally lead to point two. Yet, point two should address a part of the message that goes beyond point one. So, points one and two are not saying the same thing. But two comes out of one. Do you understand what I mean? That is, point one leads to point two in a natural way. They are not detached, isolated from one another. And point two leads to point three. Then, there should be logical, systematic, easy to be understood statements and sentences. Don't make your sentences so long, so compounded, that the people cannot understand what you are saying. The average listener, when you are preaching, is not very highly educated. And the average person in the audience is not familiar with technical words. There are technical words we use in medicine, that is, in medical science. The average man is not uh, conversant with those technical words. There are technical words we use in engineering, or in mathematics, or in the natural sciences, or in maybe uh, management, and any of the other specialized professional subjects. The average man is not familiar with those technical uh, things, so cut them out of your message. Otherwise, the message will just become jargon. Make it logical, make it systematic, and make it easy to be understood. Make your statements and sentences brief and short that they will be well understood. Number three in this part of the main body of the message. Let there be appropriate, well-chosen, direct scripture references, not distorted before you apply them. We use scriptures because the scriptures, the Bible, is the basis for your preaching. But make sure that those references you are using are very appropriate. And they are well-chosen. And they are direct scriptures on the topic you are preaching on. So that you will not be choosing a reference. You have to change and distort their meaning. And rest them out of context before you can apply them. Another thing is that you should use illustration. You will see how Jesus used parables. And the parables were very simple. Down to earth illustrations. Therefore make sure that. There are illustrations in your message. The illustrations will make the people to understand the message better. But don't use illustration just for the sake of using illustration. Only use those illustrations where appropriate. And then when you are preaching, especially when you are preaching to a small audience of 300, 400, 500, let there be eye contact. Eye contact. That is, you'll be looking up. Don't glue your eyes on your notes. Sometimes some people are nervous. And a little bit uh, afraid of the audience. Because they have not been preaching regularly. Therefore, they'll be looking down at their notes all the time. If you have been doing that, it doesn't uh, matter. God can still raise you up as a good, effective teacher and leader, but look up a few times. Look up a few times. The eye contact is very important in your preaching. Five. Let there be proper time allotted to each section of the message. You know there is an introduction. You know there are three or four points in the message. Now, if you have all together, let's say 40 minutes or one hour to give that message. You will say, this part of the message, 10 minutes. This part of the message, 15 minutes. This part of the message, 20 minutes. This conclusion may be 5 minutes. And the message 
or the meanings you give to every part will show the importance of every part. If there are three parts to the message, for example, you don't have to give um, 10 minutes to point one, 10 minutes to point two, 10 minutes to point three. No, you will give the number of minutes according to the importance of each section and according to how long each section ought to be. Then at the end of the message, there should be a good conclusion as a climax of the message. That good conclusion will be leading them to a firm decision. When you preach, you want people to take decision on what you are preaching. Therefore, you want to lead them to a firm decision. Or number two, you want to lead them to a consecration to the Lord. Consecration to the Lord. So your conclusion is summarizing everything you have said in a way that will drive them to consecration appropriate for the message. Or number three, it may be leading them to prayer for grace and for divine help. What you are saying at the conclusion may be leading them to prayer for grace and divine help. Or, number four, the conclusion may be leading them to a scriptural action demanded by the message. A scriptural action demanded by the message. Or, the conclusion may be leading them to make correction of the faults they have discovered in their lives. The faults they have discovered in their lives your conclusion may be leading them to making correction. Let's now look at Colossians again. Chapter 4, verse 17. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. This is the same thing that the Lord is telling us today. We have received the ministry. In the district and it says take heed to that ministry so that you will get rid of all hindrances and you will correct all faults and deficiencies and you will strengthen all weak areas in your ministry so that you will fulfill your ministry don't let the devil terrify you and don't let people discourage you and don't let your own weaknesses and inadequacies stop you short of the fulfillment of your ministry. The grace of God is available for you. The power of God is available for you. And the very fact that God has put you there to do something is because he saw some quality in you. He saw some worth in you. Let's look at First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. God saw something in you before he placed you on the church where you are now. He saw something in you before he gave you this responsibility. Therefore, do not allow any discouragement. Make sure that you fulfill your ministry. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You have discovered your ministry today. And you have discovered the things that we need to do to have an effective ministry. You will need to commit and consecrate yourself to the Lord. So that the purpose of God for putting you into that area of work, area of ministry, will be fulfilled. Will rise up now. I will ask help from the Lord. Don't feel inadequate. All of us need the grace of God. There is none sufficient for any of these things. We are what we are only by the grace of God. And the grace of God can make you what you ought to be. Don't say you cannot. You can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can. We have to start somewhere. We have to begin somewhere. The Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. You can do it. 
The grace of God is sufficient for everyone. You can do it. The grace of God is sufficient for everyone. Sister, you can do it. Brother, you can do it. The grace of God is available. The grace of God is available. The grace of God is available. You can become effective in the ministry. You can become effective in the ministry. You can do it. Don't let the devil tell you that so and so is better qualified than you are. In the hand of God you are qualified. Through the enablement of the Lord you are qualified. If there is any weakness, any deficiency, tell the Lord about it, he will remove them. You can do it. You can do it. You can be effective. And there's reward for it. There's reward for it. If we do it according to the mind of God, according to the plan of God, there's reward for it. Reward in this life and reward in the world to come. You can, you will. In Jesus' name we pray.
Will Brother Daniel Ifeago please come up here to pray for us? Brother Daniel Ifeago. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Most High, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We confess that it is revealing, it is challenging, it is edifying, and it is reviving. And so this morning we ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, that with the grace you are giving to us this morning and all that you have equipped us with that we will make full proof of our ministry in Jesus name we want to be effective not just effective we want to be thoroughly effective we want to leave no stone unturned we want our threshing instrument to be very very effective in threshing out the wheat and garnering them to your banner uh, above in Jesus name and so we are praying, Father, that whatever the cost, whether it be time, time to meditate on all of these things and to plan them out and to draw up timetables and to read and to study your word and to be thoroughly devoted, God of grace, we are praying that you give to us in Jesus' name. And all of those things, whatsoever they may be, either from friends or colleagues or from the family, that will constitute themselves hindrances to the fulfillment of all of these things. We are praying, Almighty God, that as you reveal them to us, that we'll begin to strike them out in Jesus' name and devote time to the things you've given to us, the things for eternity, the things that make for the lives of people you place in our hands, human lives that we cannot create, human lives that Jesus Christ has come to die for, human life that Jesus shed his blood and agonized on the cross for, Lord, that we are praying that in the name of Jesus Christ, all of these things will be preciously kept in our hearts and put into use in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we are praying that as we go on our knees at home, as we really consecrate and pray, that whatever aspect of our lives that needs to be touched, that God, they will all be touched in Jesus' name. We want a dynamic church. We want a church that is alive. A church that can be seen to be alive. A church where miracles of conversions happen every day. A church where the lives of the people are sanctified. A church where the people can consecrate for anything for the Lord. A church where the whole district will be on fire for God. Whether through crusades, whether through evangelistic outreaches in terms of personal evangelism, whatever it may take, God of grace, put our district on fire in Jesus' name. We don't want to come here and get back and discover that in a month's time or two months' time or six months' time, there is no growth. We want the impact of this meeting to be readily seen in every district in the name of Jesus Christ. Whether the problems be occult, we are praying therefore, Father, that as we begin to pray, you will bolt open our eyes and let us see the source of lack of growth and to attack it effectively in the name of Jesus Christ. So that in pulling down the strongholds, we pull down everything in Jesus' name. And where it lies with us, squarely the coordinators, that we do not visit enough, we do not listen to their problems, we do not meet them as individuals to seek what their problems are. God of grace, we are praying that as we begin to do all of these things, that God, you will add to the church as should be saved and make it to grow in Jesus' name. Thank you very much for having heard our prayers. And so, Lord, as we go, we are praying that all your word, every aspect of it, will remain alive in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. 
and our zona leaders and area leaders and house fellowship leaders and ushers that we shall be ministering to, we are praying that this same fire will be born into their hearts in Jesus' name so that they be lit up together with us so that the work will be done in Jesus' name. We praise your name because you have heard. And we pray once again that all areas that we have not been as effective as we ought to have been, either because of negligence or pure ignorance, we are praying that you forgive us everything in Jesus' name, that you wink at the past and cancel the past in Jesus' name, so that from this morning we will bear fruit. And in bearing the fruit, that the fruit will really multiply in Jesus' name. Thank you very much for having heard. We bless your name most high. And we are confident that you've heard this prayer. We are confident that something will start in the district. We are confident that uh, all our needs will be met. The land and whatever. Thank you so much for having heard. We praise your name again. For in Jesus' name we pray.